Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to review chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So stay tuned. We always start with a definition. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is defined as a non-reversible airway obstruction with a combination of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. If we do long tests, we will find that airway obstruction equals to FEB1, FBC ratio less than 0.7. As I mentioned before, chronic bronchitis is part of COPD and it's usually going to present with increased secretion in the bronchial three, non-productive cough lasting more than three months in two consecutive years. On the other hand, emphysema is going to be due to an increase in air spaces beyond the terminal bronchioles and destruction of alveolar walls without obvious fibrosis. The main cause of COPD is smoking. It represents 85% of the cases. Then 10 to 15% are occupational. So this could be due to many of the same dust that cause interstitial lung disease. And 2 to 3% due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The most common symptoms of COPD are going to be cough and shortness of breath and most of the time it's going to be sputum. The patients are going to present with increased respiratory rate, wheeze, the use of accessory respiratory muscles, hyperinflation, and sometimes pulses paradoxes. If you're in clinic or you're in an A&E, you might find it difficult to differentiate between asthma and COPD sometimes, especially in younger patients. However, there are things that could help you identify one from another. One of them is that in COPD patients are going to be older, more than 35 years old, they're going to be smoker, they're going to have a chronic cough and progressive shortness of breath. Whereas in asthma, they're going to have nocturnal symptoms, significant journal or day-to-day -day variability in symptoms. So this will help you differentiate between them too. To confirm diagnosis, we need to do a pulmonary function testing, which is basically spirometry. And we're going to find that this will help us differentiate between asthma and COPD. We're going to find an FEB1, FBC ratio less than 0.7, a decreased FEB, an increased TLC, and a decreased DLCO, which is diffusing capacity of lung for CO, aka TLCO, which is usually normal in asthma. Remember, this test should be done post bronchodilators. With the results, we can classify COP depending on the percentage of FEB1 predicted. It will be classified as mild if it's more than equal to any 80%, moderate if it's 50 to 79%, severe of 30 to 49%, and less than 30, very severe. We can also request other investigations like AVG, chest X ray. CT and ECG. On the AVG, we're going to find decreased levels of O2 and increased levels of CO2, which means type 2 respiratory failure. Our chest x ray is going to give us some signs of COPD, like more than six anterior ribs and a flat tendon diaphragm. Other findings can also include large pulmonary arteries, bullies, loss of lung markings, like an emphysema, and cardiomegaly because of the core pulmonary. Now, in CT is not usually needed for diagnosis, but emphysema might be incidental finding, which prompts consideration of COPD in some patients. Now, the ECG is going to show a right ventricular hypertrophy. Remember, there's an increased pressure in the pulmonary arteries because of the chronic inflammation, and this will lead to raised pressure in the right ventricle as well. Smoking cessation will be the first line of treatment that has proven to increase survival in COPD patients. However, if this doesn't work, we need to start off with the first line of medical treatment. If a patient is short of breath or there is exercise limitation, we can start off with a PRN inhalers. So we can use a short-acting beta agonist or a short-acting muscarinic antagonist. We can use salbutamol or ibotropium. If the shortness of breath is persistent or there are exacerbations, then we need to prescribe some regular inhalers. 
This means we can use a combination of long-acting muscarinic antagonist Lama plus a long-acting beta agonist Lava. So we could use Thyotropium and Salmeterol together. This usually is the first line. Or we can also use a combination of Lava and inhaled corticosteroids, Salmeterol and Beclometasin. You should consider if there are any asthmatic features such as prior diagnosis of asthma, atopy, eosinophilia, or substantial VEV or peak flow variability. Remember that ICS increases the risk of pneumonia and COPD, but this does not affect mortality risk. If the symptoms still persist after the double therapy, we can try triple therapy, Lama, Lava, and ICS. There are further options we can use if there is severe disease, like home nebulizers, oral immunomodulators. We can also use prophylactic acetromycin three times per week if frequent and prolonged exacerbations with sputum, O2 therapy or long-term oxygen therapy if chronically hypoxic, and non-invasive ventilation. We should consider this long-term if hypercarbonic or acetotic on long-term oxygen therapy. There's also some other alternatives like teofiline orally, carbocysteine, which is amycolytic if there is a chronic productive cough. Surgical treatment, long volume reduction surgery, balectomy, and transplant. The most common complications are exacerbations, chronic type 2 respiratory failure. Respiratory acidosis is compensated usually by raised bicarbonate and hence pH will be normal. However, this can decompensate in exacerbations. Pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure, or pulmonary. Anxiety and depression are quite common. And volley, dilated air spaces in the lung, which might require surgical excisionism. When we talk about home treatments like home nebulizers and long term oxygen therapy, we should know that nebulizers are usually easy, fast onset, and maximal dose uptake. However, they have worse side effects, they are expensive, they require maintenance, and patients might delay seeking help, and it's not a portable device. So only give if nothing else works. On the other hand, LTOT or COPD increases mortality, increases quality of life, and slows progression of core pulmonale. Now we're gonna indicate LTOT when there is severe COPD, which means FEV1 less than 30%. Signs of hypoxia like cyanosis, polycytemia, O2 sats less than 92%, and right heart failure signs like increased JVP and peripheral edema. We need to do two AVGs three weeks apart to give LTO if the PO2 is less than 7.3 kilopascals or PO2 is less than 8 kilopascals plus any of polycythemia, peripheral edema, pulmonary hypertension. Target is going to be a saturation of 88 to 92% should be used for more than 15 hours per day and can also have ambulatory O2 prescribed if they want to use it outside the home. But thank you everyone and I'll see you in another lecture, Dr. Luke.